Okay, the start of our revision session is about how the Nazis were able to take control of Germany so quickly. And the exam board will want you to know how they were able to take control and also how they actually did it in terms of using fear or persuading people. So in January 1933, Adolf Hitler becomes uh, Chancellor of Germany. And by January 1933, the Nazis are an effective political force. Um, in 1932, they had um, won the largest percentage of seats in the Reichstag, and they got a membership of about 850,000 people. However, Hindenburg and von Papen, Hindenburg is the president, and von Papen, the, the vice chancellor, are very wary of Hitler, and they don't want him to get uh, too much control. Hindenburg, of course, as president, can uh, sack uh, Hitler at any particular time. And so, with only a few Nazis in the cabinet, Adolf Hitler is given the job of Chancellor in January 1933, but Hindenburg and von Papen vote, both hope that they will be able to keep him under control. Then, on the 27th of February 1933, a fire breaks out in the Reichstag. The Reichstag is the uh, German Parliament building, and in the burning building is found a young Dutch communist called Marinus van der Lubbe. And after extensive questioning by the Gestapo, Marinus van der Lubbe, who we believe has learning difficulties, um, admits to having set the Reichstag building on fire. There's some debate about whether Marinus van der Lubbe was actually put up to this, but the long and short of it is the Reichstag fire enables Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party to gain control because it enables Hitler to go to Hindenburg and gain emergency powers. And he uses those emergency powers to arrest hundreds of communists in the period right after the Reichstag fire. Bear in mind as you're advising whether the Reichstag fire provide fear or persuasion, whether Hitler and the Nazis are using it as an opportunity to spread fear up against communists and be able to persuade both Hindenburg and the German public that communists need to be eliminated from German society. In March 1933, on the 5th of March 1933, Germany goes into a general election. Before the election, Nazi propaganda machine goes into overdrive. And there's a significant amount of propaganda in terms of speeches and posters. Also, the Sturmarbeitling, which are the group of ex-military who have helped Hitler uh, right throughout the 1920s and early 30s, um, are there to intimidate um, people as they go to the polling, uh, polling booths. And they are also there to break up um, opposition par uh, parties, uh, uh, to break up their meetings. The election doesn't go to plan for Hitler. He only gets 288 out of the 640 seats in the Reichstag. So he has to do a deal. And he manages to persuade the DNVP party to gain the seats that he needs to get a majority. Looking at the March elections, consider where Hitler and the Nazis have used fear and where they've used persuasion to get the outcome that they wanted. Now that Hitler has the majority in the Reichstag, uh, very quickly he passes, also in March 1933, the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act is a piece of legislation which Hitler is passing with the Nazis and it's passed on the 24th of March 1933. It gives the Cabinet, and importantly the Chancellor, the power to pass any law they want to without the consent or control of the Reichstag. This is a very, very fundamental change to Nazi Germany. Hitler and the Nazis can now pass any law that they want. Straight after the Enabling Act, we see this process called Gleichschalten. Gleichschalten roughly means in English, bringing into line. And the Nazis do four things to bring Nazi Germany into line in the next few months of 1933. The Civil Service Act, 
where people working in local government have to abide by Nazi principles. Hitler and the Nazis realised pretty quickly that if they're going to run Germany under their belief system, then people at the grassroots level, i.e. people running day-to-day -day, uh, activities in the country, will need to abide by Nazi rules. Anyone who was a political opponent of the Nazis, anyone who's non-Aryan, meant that they could no longer work in local government or in the civil service. So Jews and political opponents could no longer serve as teachers or judges or university lecturers, lecturers um, as all of these professions were considered part of the civil service. We then have the encouragement of anti-Semitism. We know the Nazis had had anti-Semitic views from the outset. This is really clear in Hitler's book called Mein Kampf. And as soon as they get power, they begin putting these anti-Semitic views into action. Anti-Semitic means anti-Jewish. The Civil Service Act, as we've just seen, removes them from local government and from teaching posts. The Nazis then organise a day-long boycott of all Jewish businesses. In April 1933, there's a one-day boycott of businesses. And it is actively encouraged that Jews are given a hard time and people are actively encouraged not to buy from them. So you can imagine the effect on Jewish businesses is quite profound. And here we've got Richard Stern in the doorway of his bookshop and you can see that he's wearing his medal to show that he served in the First World War. And as a Jew, you can see the SA officer outside his business actively encouraging people not to shop there. During the process of Gleichschalten, we also see book burnings. These are books that are being burnt usually by university students. They're not being actively encouraged by the Nazis to do it. A lot of university students are doing this of their own will. And what they're doing is they're emptying their libraries in the university of literature that's considered degenerate by the Nazis. That just basically means any books that are being written by Jews or communists or people that the Nazis don't hold value with and they are being burnt in large piles, often at night time, in the middle of town squares, as very public propaganda activity. We know that Nazi students burnt uh, 25,000 volumes of un-German books in May 1933 alone. And as part of Gleichschalten, we have the use of t terror. Um, in 1933, um, the Nazis really are now using their full force against opponents. Jews, communists, social democrats, trade unions all face the fear that the Nazis are now putting on them. We don't know exactly how many people uh, were murdered by the Nazis in 1933. We think up to 600 and by October over 100,000 people had been arrested. We know that the first concentration camp at Dachau, that's D-A-C-H-A-U, is opened in March 1933. And in those concentration camps are people who are put that do not fit with Nazi values, such as communists. Going further through 1933, we see the Nazis now beginning to remove all opposition. Trade unions are organisations to help and support the workforce. Yet they help support uh, workers in uh, getting pay rises and better conditions and terms and safety at work. Hitler bans the trade unions. So in effect, he's actually banning the protection and rights of workers. The tra trade unions in Germany were traditionally very left-wing. And this fell out of line with Nazi policy. So, Hitler also begins then to set up the, his own German labour front. And whilst he removes the rights and protections of employees, he believes that he's substituting that with his own German labour front and promises that he will um, get rid of unemployment. So by now we know that the Enabling Act has made the Reichstag Parliament building redundant. 
So Hitler still wants to ban all other political parties. He doesn't want any political opposition. And the Social Democrats, or the SD, they were the largest party before 1932. And once Hitler and the Nazis removed trade unions, they next had the SD in their sights. So they claimed that the SD were corrupt and that they'd been using their funding, their money, inappropriately. And we know that a total of 3,000 SD party workers were arrested, imprisoned and tortured. And once other political parties saw this treatment, they were worried that it was going to happen to them. And many political parties, really by July 1933, had been dissolved. So during 1933, we see the Nazis, through Hitler becoming Chancellor, gaining power. We see a series of events where the Nazis are using a combination of both fear and persuasion. We see the changing of the laws. We see Germany being brought into line. And then we see all opposition removed. In 1934, there are two main events you need to consider. In 1934, it's about the Nazis consolidating their power. By the end of 1933, Germany is a police state, and you will need to tell the exam board which were the key moments in that year. You'll also need to consider which of these events involve fear and persuasion, or both. But in 1934, Hitler is worried about the SA, the Storm Arbeitling, the brown shirts or the stormtroopers, the very organisation of ex-soldiers that helped him get to power. Hitler is embarrassed by them. He doesn't want them around anymore. He now, as Chancellor, has the German army. They are better equipped, they're better trained, and the German army do not like the Storm Arbeitling. So for that reason, Hitler would like to see the SA gone, but also he believes they're getting too powerful. And by 1934, the Stormarbeitling have a membership of about 3 million. They also have a leader, a very good friend of Hitler called Ernst Röhm. And Röhm in, is a homosexual. And Germany at this time was very traditional, very conservative. And homosexuality was illegal. And for all of these reasons, Hitler and the Nazis want to get rid of the Stormarbeitling. And they do this in an event that is known as the Night of the Long Knives. And during that 24-hour period in 1934, Rom is arrested and killed, as are many other the key leaders of the SA. And also during the 24 hours that follow that, Hitler and his deputies get rid of other leading figures who might pose an obstacle to the Nazis' development of power. And then by August 1934, the last person who has the ability to sack Hitler, um, Hindenburg, Paul von Hindenburg, the president of Germany, he dies. So in August 1934, Hitler becomes self-elected as chancellor and as president, and Hitler names himself Führer, which means supreme leader. And from that moment onwards, the, the German army, for example, have to swear an oath of allegiance, not just to Germany, but to Hitler himself. And this means now that Germany is a dictatorship. 